I'm going to bring to you the assistant director of the Niebuhr Center who's going to present uh, a little bit about our program and why we're starting this way for this uh, particular year. We'll break to bring up Mr. Mark Draper. I just want to welcome everybody to Elmhurst College on behalf of the Niebuhr Center. Um, <clears throat> I want to welcome our esteemed guests. This is part of our third annual Sacred Conversation on Social Justice, and this year it is part of the Still Speaking Conversations on Faith at Elmhurst College, which is a, a year-long series of dialogues on faith, its varieties, contradictions, influence in the modern world. Uh, this series celebrates the graduation centennial of two of the college's most esteemed alumni, Reinhold and H. Richard Niebuhr. Uh, therefore, it is only fitting this lecture is sponsored by the Niebuhr Center for Common Good and Social Justice. And the Niebuhr Center is committed to promoting the visions of both Reinhold and H. Richard Niebuhr and their call to service and social justice. Uh, we try to empower our students to engage in service and social justice throughout Chicagoland and around the world. Um, the <laughs> The Niebuhrs, the Niebuhrs are exceptional in that they've provided us with the philosophical, the theological, uh, and the political and intellectual foundations for engaging in service and social justice. We're very excited about our guest tonight because he is someone at St. Sabina's Chicago's on the south side of Chicago who is giving us a model of how to do a lot of what the Niebuhrs have, with a lot of what the Niebuhrs wrote about and talked about. And there's no one better, I think, in our, in our campus to introduce our speaker than one of his own parishioners and one of our students, Genesis Jelks. So I'll introduce Genesis. Thank you, Mark. Learning has never stopped for Reverend Plager. In addition to receiving his Bachelor's of Arts in Theology from Loyola University, his Master of Divinity from the University of St. Mary of the Lake, and an Honorary Doctor of Divinity from North Park Theological Seminary, he has also completed postgraduate studies at Mundelein College and the C Catholic Theological Union. Not only a student, Reverend Flager became the adoptive father of an eight-year-old son, Lamar, in 1981. In 1992, he also became the adoptive father of Baranti. In 1997, he became a father to Jarvis Franklin, who was tragically killed as a result of gang crossfire on May 30th, 1998. As an activist, Father Flager has been involved in many issues, such as campaigns against the sale of drug paraphernalia, billboards that targeted children with alcohol and tobacco advertising and saturated communities of color, negative music that glorified violence and degraded women, and the easy access to guns and the violence that is snatching the lives of children across the country. Father Flager is the founder of the Employment Resource Center, the ARC Youth Center, St. Sabina Social Service Center, Thea Bowman Spiritual Advance Center, the Samaritan House for the Homeless, St. Sabina 80-Unit Elders Village, and the Beloved Community Incorporated. As a member of St. Sabina Parish, I am pleased to introduce to you none other than Father Michael Flager. Thank you. Um, you travel quite a distance. <laughs> um, thank you for the invitation to, uh, to be here today. Um, I didn't realize it was going to be a crowd this big, but um, I'm honored to be here and uh, share with you our talk. We talk about the face of social justice. In the book of Acts, the fourth chapter, there is a scripture that talks about Peter and John. And they're called by the leaders of the town that say they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men and were astonished. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. Since they could see that the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say, so they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem know that they've done an outstanding miracle and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn, warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. 
Oftentimes when you go to amusement parks or go to public places, you will be told and you will see signs that are safety rules. They will say, don't run, don't go behind the ropes, don't touch, don't enter into this doorway, safety rules. But it seems to me that in the institution called church, in the last 20 years, we also have developed a whole lot of safety rules. They may not be written on signs, uh, but they are established rules just the same as the amusement parks. Rules like, don't offend anybody. Rules like, don't talk about anything controversial. Rules like, don't change anything. Rules like, don't talk about justice. Don't talk about things that are different. Don't rock the boat. Just be safe. I think as a result of that, it seems to me today that we have developed in this country a whole lot of safe churches, a whole lot of safe mosques, and a whole lot of safe synagogues. Places that now safeness has become the norm rather than the exception. It is interesting to me when people do polls about why people do have left the church or why they, people do not attend the church the common answer is because people feel that after the preaching or the singing or the dancing or the praying are over, nothing happens. Because it seems that churches have become trained to sort of blend in society, to become mainstream, to not rock the boat, in fact, to become very safe. When we examine the motto of the New Testament church, or when we read about the book of Acts, we find that there was nothing safe at all about the church of the Acts of the Apostles. There was nothing safe at all about the church of Jesus Christ. In fact, it was a dangerous church. And every place the Apostles went, social revelation and revolution took place, economic order turned upside down. In the church of Acts, lives were changed and communities were transformed God was glorified and justice was always proclaimed. Justice was not an elective of the church. Justice was the bloodstream of the church. See, the truth is, if you really like business as usual, the truth is, if you really just like the status quo, one of the most dangerous places you should ever be is in the presence of God. Because you see, when you get in the presence of God, God reveals to us what he wants for church. We're reminded that the church was founded by Jesus, not us. Reminded that the church was called to be what he fashioned it and molded it and called it to be, not what we've turned it into. I think sometimes the church today, in fact, has the same, suffers from the same thing many of citizens of our country do, a stolen identity. We've lost the concept and the identity and the role of who we're supposed to be. When we get into the presence of God, he begins to tell us the kind of church he calls, the kind of church he believes, and the expectations he has for those who say they follow him. I believe that it calls us to become a dangerous church. And I believe that because I think as a Christian, I follow a radical Christ. It is not surprising to me that the two most turned out times of church in our churches are two times of the year. They are Christmas and we're getting ready for a big turnout. <laughs> Christmas and Easter. It doesn't surprise me that the two largest turnout of our churches are Christmas and Easter. Why? Because at Christmas, we have this adorable babe in a manger that we can look at and adore and get all sorts of warm feelings about. And then at Easter, there is this crucified Christ who died for us on the cross and caused us to remember the death that he went through out of his love for us. But we forget that between Bethlehem and between Calvary, there was this radical Christ 
who gave a new value system, who turned tables upside down, who called the religious leaders vipers and hypocrites. There was a radical Christ that talked about the poor, that said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor, sight to the blind, freedom to the captives. There was this radical Christ that said, whatever you do for the least your sisters and brothers, you do for me, a radical Christ, who when they tried to trap him and say, well, who is our neighbor? Rather than answer that trap, because we said, this is your neighbor, then we can decide who's not our neighbor. And he said, in fact, just be a neighbor and care for your sisters and your brothers. I believe with all my heart that God wants to establish his kingdom through the church, through a church who will no longer play it safe, but have the faith and the conviction and the courage to live dangerously, to transform the ordinary into the extraordinary. Sisters and brothers, on September 6th, in 1955, a mother by the name of Mamie Till Mobley, the mother of Emmett Till, remember? who was brutally killed and murdered in Mississippi, chose to be dangerous. She made a decision to open the casket of her son because she said she wanted the whole world to see the ugliness of what had happened to her son. She said she did so so America could look at itself and come to grasp the evil and the hate that had killed her son. Well, I believe if we are to, as a nation, reach our potential of greatness, I believe if we are a nation going to reach what we were really called to be and say we were founded on, then we're going to have to become a dangerous church. We're going to have to become dangerous enough to understand we've got to open up the casket. We've got to let people see the ugliness of the faith and the courage to see the unjust and unequal playing fields of the world in which we live today in 2011. We have got to expose the justice and the unequal playing fields that are causing so many of our brothers and sisters to literally be destroyed. We're going to have to have the courage to open up the casket and see the ugliness of the world that is killing our sisters and brothers and the future of America. We're going to have to have the courage to open up the casket of a nation that seemingly has decided that the poor are disposable. That seemingly have forgotten about the poor of our country. That we become comfortable with a whole segment of people and masses of people who have felt no economic recovery. Don't get fooled because the Dow Jones is up. Because people on 79th Street don't understand how it's up because they're not feeling anything different. The Dow Jones up means nothing to those that sleep under viaducts and under expressways all over the city of Chicago and our major cities all around this country in abandoned buildings and in doorways. It doesn't mean anything to them that the Dow Jones is up. I have a whole community outside of St. Sabina's church doors who were in a depression and a repression long before the fall of Wall Street. Something is wrong, sisters and brothers. Something is wrong with a country that creates beggars. It is not that there's not enough food to feed the hungry and to feed everybody. We're told time and time again the storeroom was stocked. The problem is not the supply. The problem is the will. Because we somehow decided that everybody is not going to eat. That everybody's life is not worth the same. See, everybody in Washington, every group in this country has a lobbyist, but the poor. But Jesus told us that the church is supposed to be the lobbyist for the poor. So when the church is no longer doing its job, when people of faith, whether Muslim or Christian or Jew, when we are no longer raising our voices to be the lobbyists for the poor and the disenfranchised and the alienated of our society, then we have failed our purpose. Now the poor have no voice to speak their cause. We've lost our mission because the church has become so safe. We're going to have to have the courage to open the casket. 
I want Michelle Alexander, and if you have not yet read her book, I beg you to read her book, The New Jim Crow of Mass Incarceration. Where while crime dropped 20% in the last 20 years, in the last 27 years, people under the U.S. correctional system went from 1.8 million to 7.2 million. How have crime dropped so have we gone from 1 million to 7 million in incarceration? Shuttling our children from second class schools to first class jails. Where the government says that 13% of our drug users, of illicit drug users in America are African American. But 35% of drug arrests are African American. What's wrong with that picture if 13% are users and 35% are being incarcerated? We're going to have to open the casket and face the reality that today incarceration has taken all the rights that civil rights people fought, lived, and died and were murdered for. They fought to get the right for somebody to have the right to vote, the right to receive free food, the right to get a college tuition, the right for housing or a job. And now laws in this country have taken away those rights for those who come out of incarceration and are now become a second class citizen. Now they can't get the job. Now they can't get tuition. Now they can't get free food. Now they can't get public housing. Look and see what we've done. We have in fact taken the 13th Amendment, what it fought for to eradicate slavery. And now we make slavery legal in our country because of how we treat second-class citizens of incarceration. And let me ask another question. How do we awaken a society to talk about re-entry of a people that America never welcomed in the first place? Yes, brothers and sisters, we're going to have to open the casket. We're going to have to open the casket of failed education system of America. And understand it's been failed by Democrats. It's been failed by Republicans. And guess what? It can be failed by the Tea Party. We are unanimous in this country in failing to do decent education. Where 47% of black males graduate from high school. 47%. I understand we have some great successes. We have Urban Prep in Chicago. We have the Hardin Children's Drone. We have Eagle Acorn. But the truth is, while we are celebrating the successes of an Urban Prep, it was amazing to me last year, and you, we all saw it. Remember Urban Prep had all their seniors graduate and went to four-year universities, right? It was on World News. It was on Nightline. It was on Good Morning America. The whole world was celebrating, and I thought to myself, does anybody find a problem that we're celebrating because one school had all their graduates go on to college? Ought that not be the norm in America? Shouldn't that be what we should be asking every high school student to do is turn out graduates that go to college? Why are we being so excited that one school does it instead of being mad? Why aren't the other schools doing it? We have to ask ourselves the question while we're graduating with success, success and patting ourselves on the back for urban prep. What about the 1.2 million children we lose every single year who drop out of our education system? And the truth is, data tells us that a black male student who manages to achieve a high school education speaks more about the student's ability than the system and what it provided for him. In fact, data tells us that the most, the most of America's systems contribute to the condition in which black males have an equal chance of graduating from high school and going to jail. Dr. King told us that our job about the Good Samaritan is not just going to the side of the road and picking up the brother or sister who's lying at the side of the road, but he said our job is also to transform the kind of society that is placing people at the side of the road. And can I say this to all those who are sitting here who may be teachers, 
or maybe considering going in the profession of teaching and the vocation of teaching. It's a great profession. And let me say, we do not pay our teachers enough. We don't value them enough. We don't encourage them enough. We don't hold them in hell grounds enough. But at the same time, let me say this, I never underestimate the job of a teacher. Spike Lee was at our church a few weeks ago, and Spike Lee said he went in to film because he said a teacher took time with him. And a teacher made him feel his gift of taking pictures was valuable and important. So something he was just doing as a hobby, he said, because a teacher took time with me, I end up being a film writer and producer. Here are those who are looking to the vocation of teaching. Children today don't care about what you know until they know that you care first about them. Our children must feel valued. Our children must feel important. Our children must feel like they are special again. If we are going to become a dangerous church and put a public face on justice today, then like Mamie Till Mobley, we're going to have to have the courage to open the casket on the evil in a world that has seemingly given permission to violence in America. We have become immune. We have become immune in America to the genocide of black and brown children that are being shot down in the streets of America every single day. And we have a society that doesn't seem to care. I must admit that I, like most and all of you here, were saddened and I was horrified at the shooting of Congresswoman Gifford and all those who were shot and killed in Tucson, Arizona. But I was also troubled. I was troubled that while the head of the FBI was sent to Tucson, Arizona to say, find out how this happened, how this person did this, how this person got the gun, the head of the FBI was sent to Tucson, Arizona to find out the roots of the cause of what shot these 19 people. But where is the government responding to black and brown children dying in the Chicago area, in Newark, New Jersey, in Oakland, California, in Philly, in South Central? Are these children not as important as Congresswoman Gifford? Have we put a different value on life? To say a congressperson's life is more valuable than a child. We don't know what that child that got killed yesterday in Chicago had in him or her. We don't know if the cure of cancer, we don't know if the cure of AIDS, we don't know what was in that child, but we had to become just as outraged when children die who are black and brown. And then we still don't have the courage to do anything about the gun industry. It is very difficult, sisters and brothers, for me to tell my community and us to tell communities around the city to break the code of silence while America has a code of silence about the killing of our children. It's very difficult for my team to tell my children to break the code of silence while the blood money of the NRA still speaks louder than the innocent blood of children dying in our nation. And let me be clear about this. People say, oh, there you go with that gun thing again. I'm in the member of the NRA. Let me clearly understand what I'm saying. Congressman Gifford and the people in Tucson could possibly not have had as many people shot or killed had we put back in place the assault weapon ban and the large magazine clips. The one that President Clinton put in, that President Bush let die in 2004, and that President, Clinton, President Obama said he was gonna do when he was running for president. But here we are two years later that assault weapons are still allowed to be bought in Chicago. Our country banned assault weapons in Iraq. <laughs> but we don't ban them in America. You cannot hunt with an assault weapon. There will be nothing left to eat. So an assault weapon was created for military to kill. But you can buy assault weapons all over America because we have lacked the courage in Washington and in Congress and all around the major cities of this country to put assault weapon ban back in place for good. People say, well, the guns, the easy access to guns. Yes, stop the easy access to guns. I know what the Second Amendment said. I know that the Second Amendment said that people have a right to own a gun. Fine, if that's what people want to do, that's fine. All I'm saying is, title a gun just like a car. 
Guess what? People say, well, the criminal will always get a gun. No, they won't. If I have a car and I give it to President Ray and he gets in an accident and I didn't transfer the title to him, what happened? Who are they coming for? Me. Because I still have the title to the car. Why well, say right from the manufacturers? Why can't we title guns right from the manufacturers? So if somebody goes to Chuck's Gun Shop on the south side of Chicago and buys 200 guns, they have 200 titles. You don't transfer the title and hold yourself accountable and responsible for guns, then if that gun is caught in a crime, they're coming back to the one who bought 200 guns to sell them on the streets of Chicago and come back and hold you accountable. We've got to make people accountable for this violence in our country. The face of justice is going to demand courage. Courage to open the casket facing the injustices of our time. To reopen the, the casket that shows the racism that's alive and well in 2011. Imagine the highest body of government of the United States Senate in America has no African American on it. And we don't find a problem with that. We go to Nassau and we see an entire amount of African Americans studying to go to the moon. And yet we go to Fortune 500 companies, go get the small amount of African Americans and women. We go to Nassau and we find lots of African Americans and women. We go to the Senate and find fewer African American, no African Americans and fewer women. Something is wrong with the country when it's easier to go to the moon than it is to go to the Senate. <laughs> Something's wrong with that country. We've got to deal with the racism and the sexism and the classism. Understand, these are not just intellectual terms. We can study at Elmhurst and study at other universities. But it's the treatment and behavior of too many of our brothers and sisters who deal with sexism and classism and racism every single day and keeping masses of people shackled, robbing them like that Samaritan saw the person on the side of the road half dead and not allowing them to have the divine destiny we say God placed them. And we in our churches and our mosques and our synagogues, we can't keep telling our children, you have a divine purpose, you have a divine destiny, you have a divine plan, you've got to be able to achieve that for which God called you, and then not open the doors and kick down the ceilings that are keeping them from achieving it. We have to open the casket on the kind of society that we are with each other, where we are the most technology-equipped society in history. We know how to text each other. We know how to twit each other. We know how to email each other. We know how to iPad each other. We know how to Facebook each other. And we're silly enough to think those 3,000 people are your friends. They ain't your friends. They don't even know who you are. We have all this technology that so much can that we can communicate with. But guess what? While we have learned how to communicate, we don't know how to be community anymore. We don't know how to be sisters and brothers. We no longer value looking each other in the eye and talking to each other and understanding the gift of humanity of each other. A kind of humanity where Mahatma Gandhi would bow down and reverence every person he saw to say that I can acknowledge the God in you and you would know the God that's in you. Now we disrespect each other and don't talk to each other and ignore each other and we'll sit in a restaurant or sit in a car with four or five other people on a cell phone or a text with somebody across the city and ignore the people right in front of us. We have to understand if we forget how to be community, then in fact that we will be guilty of the chaos Dr. King warned us we would be about if we fail to learn how to be brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters, we have to have the courage the courage to understand the devastating times that we are in. How dare we, and this is Mike Flegger now, I never know how to keep my mouth shut. How dare we say that we have gone in with armed forces because of the violence against human beings in Libya, but we don't care about the violence against human beings here in America every single day that are living in fear. How dare we? How do we have a moral voice across an ocean? 
And I'm trying to figure out if we wanted to do something across an ocean, how come while we were running into Libya, we didn't run into the Sudan, we didn't run into Rwanda, we didn't run into Darfur, we don't run into places where black people are suffering everyday violence. We don't even run into the south side of Chicago. But we can say it's immoral what's happening to people across an ocean. Well, sisters and brothers, and I'm going to stop so we can go into some Q&A. We have to understand that these are devastating times. These are devastating times that I have never thought I would live to see in my life. I've been at St. Sabine, as you've probably read lately, <laughs> for quite a number of years. But I've never seen so many hungry people in my life. I never saw so many grandmothers and grandfathers and single mothers standing in line in the cold saying, can you just give me something to eat? I've never seen so many people when I go to their homes who have no electricity and no heat and sold most of their furniture but are on some mattresses on a floor trying to survive and take care of their children. I've never seen so many people unemployed and saying, just give me a job, I'll do anything. Just let me take care of my family. I've never seen so many children afraid to go to and from school. Do we understand in America that the new landmarks of urban America are becoming yellow police tape and, and balloons and teddy bears where people have been shot and killed? Our people come back from war and we have an entire amount of, of, of post-traumatic stress, help and aid for people who come back from a war zone. But a child gets shot or killed in Chicago and all the classmates and all the school get a one-day crisis counselor and you're supposed to be all right. But you've got to go buy every day the locker where he used to have a locker. You've got to buy the desk where she used to sit. You've got to remember that in your class pictures every year, the three and four and five and six students that are no longer in your class picture because they were killed. We don't understand that our children are living in post-traumatic stress every single day from Newark until Oakland trying to survive a violent society. And we tell them, study hard in school. Well, how do you study when you're afraid to come to school? You have poor education in school. And then you're afraid to come home from school. I remember a day when they used to say, Father Mike, would you pray for me? I got a test Friday. And now I have children asking me, Father Mike, would you pray I don't get killed this school year? Something's real wrong about that. Something's wrong about a society that has turned into a place where our children are afraid to go to school. But let me close saying this to you. Indeed, these are devastating times. But if there's any place the light ought to shine in the midst of darkness, it's in we who say we were entrusted by the light of Christ. If there's any place the light ought to shine, it ought to be us who say that we've been given the task to be the light of the world and to be the salt of the earth. The truth of the matter is, this time with all this devastation and all these problems and unemployment and, and violence and, and racism and sexism, this ought to be the church's finest hour ever to shine in this country and give people hope. Give people reason to believe again and fight again. To understand that our faith is not just something to help us endure. But our faith is to call us to fight against every Pharaoh wherever they raise their head and let the people be free. Brothers and sisters, the kingdom of God has been held hostage too long by preachers and priests, by rabbis and imams who have tried to become too safe. I said to a pastor that was speaking at down in Atlanta a few weeks ago, I said, isn't it sad? You know when you hear about the church with all the violence in the world? When the pastor gets up to do the eulogy at the funeral. Ought the church ought to be doing something to stop the funeral? We read about Jesus stopping a funeral procession for a woman bearing her son. But if we 
decided that our job as Christians or Muslims or Jews is just to do the eulogies after somebody's been killed? The power of God, I believe, is waiting to be displayed. I believe this is the moment. I believe this is the time for a dangerous church to rise up. So my charge to you, whether you are Christian, whether you are Jew, whether you are Muslim, I dare you to leave your comfort zone. I dare you to leave your safe church, your safe faith place. I dare you to go where the pain is. Don't just send a check. Don't just pray for them in church. Go where the pain is and feel it and see it and see the anguish and see the tears and see the hurt. Go where injustice is. Go where the marginalization is. Go that most affects most people in this country. Choose, like Dr. King said, I choose to identify with the poor. I choose to identify with the outcast. I choose to identify with those thrown to the side of the road. I charge you and charge me, have the courage to ask the prophetic questions to a world that seems like it has become well adjusted to injustice. America seems to be more concerned with the drug habits of Lindsay Lohan. <laughs> we have more hype about what Charlie Cheen is going to say next. In fact, I am so sick and tired of hearing about the dress, the flowers, and the cake of a royal wedding in Britain. Anybody else tired of that besides me? <laughs> We're obsessed with the drug habits of Lindsay Lohan and Charlie Cheen and the wedding of Kate and William, and we're ignoring sisters and brothers dying all around us every single day. The conditions of masses of people outside these doors depends on us. So my charge to you and me is to become dangerous. Will that cost you? Trust me. <laughs> it will cost you. But I tell people all the time, the two most important times of my day is the morning when I wake up. My first hour is for me and God. My first hour is for just me and God to get together and get into his presence and realize he's the one that woke me up. He's the one that gave me this day. What does he want me to do? Can I live it right for him? That's the most important part of it. I won't give that time up for nobody. The second most important part of my day is at night. When I stand in front of that mirror to scrub my teeth and wash my face. And I want to look in that mirror and be able to say, God, I try to do right. And I want to be able to look at myself and say, you didn't sell out. You didn't compromise what you believe, no matter the cost, no matter who liked you or didn't. I see we've grown up in these crazy books. I'm okay, you're okay. How to win friends, influence people. Forget all that. Because if you're going to be dangerous, people are going to hate you. If you're going to be dangerous, people are not going to like you. If you're going to be dangerous, some people will plot on you and lie about you. But at the end of the day, who the hell cares what people think of you? At the end of the day, is it really important what people think of us? Or what the God who's going to judge us thinks of us? Do we want people to say, hey, you're great? Or do we want God to say he's well pleased in who we become in him? So brothers and sisters, I charge you like Peter and John, let the forgotten and the disenfranchised know somebody cares about him. I beg you, be an unpaid lobbyist for the poor. Be an unpaid lobbyist for the hurting, for those suffering from racism and materialism and militarism and sexism and classism. Be an unpaid lobbyist for those who feel like nobody even cares they live or die. Like Peter and John, I dare you, make the system nervous. 
like Peter and John, dare to come in and ask the questions about a country that seemingly has lost its conscience. I dare you like Mary of Bethany who went in the room and broke open her alabaster jar and the Bible says she changed the atmosphere. I dare you to change the atmosphere wherever you are, in your workplace, in the marketplace, on your block, in your home with your friends. Change the atmosphere. When you walk in the room, let the devil get mad. Change where you're at and make it and demand it to be a place of justice and a place of peace. Justice is the public face of love. You cannot say that you love the God whom you do not see and not love your sisters and brothers whom you see every day. If you love, then you must fight for justice. Last couple weeks ago, somebody said to me, Flagger, don't you ever get tired? Don't you ever get disgusted and feel like giving up? I said, oh, absolutely. Last two weeks more than ever. <laughs> But you know what? Because I know God, I am a prisoner of hope. Because the only way to give up is if God resigns from being God. The only reason to quit if God says it's too hard for him. The Bible tells us he's already won the battle. He's just looking for some soldiers to go out and fight it. Sisters and brothers, I dare you, don't give up, don't quit, don't get disgusted, don't get comfortable, don't fit in society, don't become what you used to say was wrong. A couple of months ago, I got a whole lot of hope. I was watching one day on TV like all of us and I saw what was going on in Egypt. And I saw people rising up and saying they want a new day for Egypt and I couldn't help but think that maybe the drums that beat in Africa and in the south maybe the drums that beat in the civil rights movement maybe the drums that beat through Malcolm and Medgar and maybe the drums that made Rosa and made Mamie Till Mobley and all those great people maybe the drums that made Oscar Romero speak like he spoke maybe the drums that made Cesar Chavez and Doris Huerta to become who they are maybe the drums that caused Dorothy Day and Mother Teresa to care about the least maybe those drums are still beating we just haven't heard them being beaten by enough people. So I leave you with the words of one of the greatest theologians I think that ever lived, Sam Cooke. <laughs> he said, it's been a long time coming, but I do know that I know that I know change will come and you must be the ones to bring it. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together once again for this outstanding man. Once again. This was fabulous. Father Flager has been gracious enough to, con uh, to consider answering some Q&A from the audience and so forth. So I would like to offer up the opportunity to bring to your attention that this, in, this young lady right here in black has a microphone and this gentleman over here in the brown suede jacket has also another microphone. If you would like to, raise your hand and we will come to you and try to assist you to get your question answered. Uh, we will do this for approximately about 15 to 20 minutes. We will not wear him out, okay? Thank you. I have to recognize my former business manager who retired has been with me and like my second mother for about 40 years, 50 years maybe, is sitting here. Ann Gaskin, it's so good to see you, Ann. God bless you. God bless you. Yes. Thank you very much. 
I think we all know too well the evils of national socialism and communism, but I don't think we know the evils of individualism yes, sir. in this country. And what on earth do you say to the person on TV who is persuading people that if your church talks about social justice, be afraid, run away, go somewhere else, return to your individualism? Well, what I say to them is obviously you haven't read the Bible. And because the Bible, first of all, the Bible says, quote, God is a God who loves justice. Jesus' opening sermon when he came out of the desert was when he quoted Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Free the prisoners, free the captive, give sight to the blind. So I'm amazed today, and l let me just say this. I've been asked, you know, by some authorities, um, sometimes, <laughs> um, why are you such a hell raiser? And why are you so out of sync with the church? And I say to them, hold up. I'm the same person I always was. What happened to the church? I grew up with the Berrigans. I grew up with Dick Morris Rowe. I grew up with Jack Egan. I grew up with people like Oscar Romero who preached the liberation theology. I grew up with the George Higgins. I grew up with people where there were nuns and priests that were marching all over Selma and Birmingham. And today they say, leave that alone. If you talk justice, leave the church. Or stop giving your money. No. No, that is the church. That's the church of Jesus Christ. We have created a golden calf in place of the church of Jesus Christ. We've lost our identity. It's time to get back to what the church of the Bible is. Yes, that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> you get me upset. <laughs> Another question. Right here? Oh, Rick, there's. <laughs> trying to get me in trouble because these TV cameras are here. I'm not going to let you do this. Oh, this will get you in trouble. But <laughs> uh, what's wrong with the hierarchy? <laughs> you know, there's no leadership there in social justice. I, I heard in Wisconsin that the Archbishop approved of the idea that uh, these people were protesting, but I didn't hear much else. <laughs> you really want to take me out, don't you? <laughs> I just... No, made... I want you to replace them, but I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I believe that the hierarchy in the church has been caught in a time zone of a business as usual, say mass, go home, um, 1940s, 1930s church. And the world is dying outside our doors and we are just worried about more the language in the use of our missile we're more concerned if you bow at the right time. I asked a bishop one time, I said, we're concerned and I've been corrected because I don't teach my people when to bow at the right time. What about the people laying on the street that we're not dealing with outside? I think we have somehow just ignored the cries of people. I pray every day that the hierarchy will get convicted to feel the pain. It was the cries of the people of Egypt that God said, I heard your cries and I answered you. Do we no longer hear cries? Do we no longer see people hurting? Do we no longer know that there are people out there struggling in marriage, struggling raising children, struggling to try to pay your bills, struggling to deal with all sorts of daily issues they got to deal with, and then we come in the church and say, don't talk about any of that, don't talk about getting involved in any of that, let's just pray, and then we do our Lord, hear our prayer. For the hungry, Lord, hear our prayer. For the sick, Lord, hear our prayer. For the people without a job, Lord, hear our prayer. And God's sitting there saying, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's why you're here. <laughs> Don't tell me. I know what I see it. You do something about it. There was a great movie. I'm showing my age now. 
Remember the movie Old God with John Denver and George Burns? Yeah. Yeah. Great scene in that movie. John Denver turns to George Burns, who is playing the part of God. Did a very good job, I think. <laughs> he is still alive. You all know that George Burns is still alive. And he says, if you're God, why do you let so many people suffer? And why do you let so much pain in the world? George Burns turns to him and he says, why do I? No, why do you? I gave you all the talent and all the power and you've let it happen. I think we have forgotten that this world God put in our hands and said, work it and make it fruitful. We, I think the church and the hierarchy had become absentee landlords of a garden God gave us to take care of. And I think God will hold us accountable. I just wanted to make a comment. You know, you turn the TV on and you find out how our, how the lobbyists are paying off our representatives and our senators and the N NRA with all their money paying off senators and they're, they're all going to do all this good and then they fail. So that's what my concern about. I get so discouraged what's going on with our federal government too. I do. Um, I don't think it's an accident. In February, we had in Chicago one of the most important elections in the last 21 years. A new mayor and every alderman's seat was up to be voted on. This huge transition in the city. Only 42% of Chicagoans voted. When they did a poll, I think it was NPR, one, one of the radio stations did a poll about and asking people why they didn't vote, they said, because they no longer have faith in government. Now, I understand that because of the bureaucracy in Washington and Springfield and the craziness of government and, you know, really, it's hard to have faith in it. But here's my point. Is that maybe the same reason people don't go to church? Because they've lost faith in the institution. See, government was never supposed to be prophetic or just or righteous. It's government. It's politics. It's compromise. It's work the deals. But now that has seeped into becoming what we do in the church. And it's one thing if government is ineffective. God help us if we who call ourselves the followers of Christ are ineffective. Because that's what we'll be judged. We're not going to be judged whether we're good politicians. But we're going to be judged. We have the audacity to call ourselves Christians or Jews or Muslims and not live by the Torah or the Quran or the Bible that we say we believe in. How dare we? Gardner Taylor, Dr. Gardner Taylor, a great, great preacher, said it best. He said about Christians, he said, I don't care about all these churches doing all the things they want to do. What, do whatever you want to do. Just stop doing it in the name of Jesus. Oh. Thank you so much for Thank challenging you. us um, just in regards to looking out for our sisters and brothers. I appreciate that. I have a question um, for, say, all of us. If, if we belong to a safe church and we've been a part of a safe church for years, there's so much injustice in the world and in our neighborhoods. Where in the world do we start? How do we begin to become a dangerous church? Well, I think every person who calls himself a believer, first of all, Christian, Jew, Muslim, Sheikh, uh, whatever, if you are a believer, there ought to be some issue that you're passionate about. And if there's not some issue that you're passionate about, why not? Get involved in something. Connect with some group. Connect with some other brothers and sisters who believe in and, and the thing, whether it's the death penalty, whether it is abortion, whether it is um, racism, whether it is a war, whatever. Find some issue you're passionate about and get engaged with other people are passionate about, number one. Number two, why do we allow our churches to be silent? If I go to a restaurant 
And I sit there and I order food. And I don't like what I ate. I don't like what they're serving me. I pay for it. And then would walk out and say, I'll see you next Sunday. <laughs> I wouldn't do that at a restaurant. So why are we doing it at church? Why are we sitting as passive, apathetic people that say we never talk about the injustice, we never talk about the problems of the world, we never do these issues, and then we put in our money in the offering and we go out and say, see you next Sunday, Pastor. <laughs> no. No, we got to sit down with our pastors and we got to sit down with our bishops and our cardinals and our elders and whoever the head is of the denomination or, or the imam, imams or the, or the rabbis and say, no, we have to become more active because I feel like we're not making our flesh, the word, a flesh. James says, do not be just doers. Here is the word, but be doers of the word. I always tell people, my description of, of church is this. On Sunday morning, or on Bible study at Tuesday night, it's the huddle time. Nobody goes to a game to see the huddle. <laughs> if you do, you should see somebody. <laughs> That's not healthy. What we do is we say, I'm coming to see what you do when you come out of the huddle because of what you did in the huddle. And that's the same thing with church. We huddle on Sunday. We huddle in our ministries. We huddle in our Bible studies. But what are you going to do when you get out of the huddle? How is your neighborhood going to be different? How is this city going to be different? How is this state going to be How is the world going to be different because we went to church? Because guess what? If we're going to church and nothing's any different, then people who don't go to church say, that's why I don't go. Nothing is changing. People are praying every Sunday. Every Sunday. How many Christians in here? No matter your denomination, every Sunday, whenever what denomination you're in, you say a prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Y'all with me? Yeah. <laughs> Want to make sure we still do the right prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Where? Oh. On earth. Do you think every, year, every Sunday when we're praying that, God's saying, Hello? <laughs> Did you hear what you just said? My kingdom on earth. And we just pray it and we go right there. I will be done on earth as heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us. And we go right through. God's saying, you missed it. You missed it. You're supposed to be changing stuff. When you leave the church, you ought to leave to make a difference. People ought to see a difference in us because we huddled on Sunday. And if they didn't, then we are hypocrites. And we've given bad witness to this Christ who we say is almighty and we say who can do all things. Yes, I'm sorry. You can get me going. Was there another question? One more one here. One more question. Okay. One more question. Oh, great. Um, how important do you think it is that churches of different faiths reach out to one another to work together on social issues? And if you think it's important, what, it would, what would it look like? <laughs> well, not only different denominations, different faiths. Yeah. I mean, we, we talk about the GDs and the BDs and the Bicewards. There is no greater gangs than church. There really isn't. There's not a greater gang in the church because I'm Catholic, I'm Church of God in Christ, I'm Lutheran, I'm Methodist, I'm Jewish, I'm uh, Muslim. Hold up. I thought, even though we have differences of theology, yes. But we all say we believe in God and we all have some basic principles that are in all the major faiths. We believe in love of God, service of people, care for the poor. We were talking about this a little bit earlier. You know the one thing that brings us all together? Service. That's it. So whether you're Catholic, Jewish, or Muslim, you can all go to the food garden. You can all feed somebody hungry. You can all work on some housing for people that are homeless. You can all work on the, the education issue in America is not a Christian, a Muslim, or a Jewish, a Democrat, or Republican. It's a national problem. 
So when we decide to stop being games and start being disciples of whatever our religious tradition is and serve people, all of a sudden all that little denomination, that's, that's the golden calves that people created under Moses. That's all we do. We have become so insectuous and, and so we have become so inbred on ourselves. We spend all our times in our churches and denominations feeding and taking care of ourselves and the hell with everybody else in the world. Well, guess what? It's time to change. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've never had the privilege of hearing him before, wasn't this wonderful today for you? <laughs> Over the course of time, I've had the privilege to watch, to look, to learn, to be close, to work beside in some areas, and hear some of the things that Father Flager is saying. And it has inspired me to go out and to push in the areas of social justice. I ask that you listen, take heed to the challenge, and that we will all become a better church, group of community members, college, become a better college because of what we've heard today. And if we take it to heart, we shall be, we shall be. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, once again, let's give it up for Father Flager. Now.